Now it is our honor to introduce to Johns Hopkins University our keynote speaker, Tor Lairdahl, Executive Chairman of Lairdahl, a company that has for over half a century epitomized the civet ethos, identifying a critical healthcare need and developing an effective solution. In the case of Lairdahl, the problem identified by Tor's own father in 1960 was the need for training in CPR, a revolutionary technique developed right here at Johns Hopkins University. Since that day, over 400 million people worldwide have been trained in CPR, many, many using the amazing tools developed by Lardal. In recent years, Lardal has identified the need for innovation in global health, launching in January of this year, Lardal Global Health, focused on the health of, mo of mothers and newborns. So in this day after Mother's Day, please join me in welcoming our keynote speaker, Tor Lardal. Well, um, good morning, everyone. It's a tremendous uh, honor and pleasure to be with you today. And uh, to follow these uh, students is really a, a hard act, but I will do my best. This uh, <coughs> presentation has been called Integrated Innovation, Saving More Lives uh, Together. And it has three parts, the pioneers, the day of birth, and the new alliance. So let's start with the pioneers. Before 1960, a person was considered dead when he stopped breathing or his heart stopped uh, bleeding. That was the clinical death. And then something revolutionary happened right here at Johns Hopkins that changed the definition of death. From clinical to biological death. And whatever is threatening or stopping the transport of oxygen to the brain is starting a dying process. That dying process can be changed, can be stopped, and the person can be resuscitated. And I'm going to take you through uh, what has happened over the following 50 years. First with the perspective of the developing countries and then uh, with the perspective of the even much higher opportunities going forward for the uh, developing world. But let's take a look at what happened in uh, 1960 at Johns Hopkins with Peter Safar, often called the father of modern resuscitation, who was working at Baltimore City Hospital, which I understand has later been merged with the Johns Hopkins, and with Dr. Kovenhoven, Nickebocker, and Jude. So let's see what's happening. Dr. Safer knew that the chest or back pressure methods did not work. We know as an institute. Can we turn off the light, uh, sound a little? Tricks with the head, jaw, neck to provide an open air passage. Nature was not good to us. Most animals have straight air passages, so when you push on the chest, you can move air. Humans have kinked air passage, so when they become relaxed in coma or anesthesia, Total obstruction. Safer enlisted Captain Martin McMahon, who was in charge of the Baltimore City Fire Department's Ambulance Corps. McMahon enthusiastically joined Safer's experiment. He provided firemen to test the new method. Dr. Safer provided the victims. 39 physicians, medical students, and one nurse courageously volunteered to be sedated, fully paralyzed, so their normal breathing would stop and have a dozen laypersons try various techniques of artificial ventilation to see what worked. Dr. James Jude worked at Johns Hopkins on a cardiac research team headed by Dr. William Cowenhoven. Dr. Cowenhoven. They made a surprising discovery quite by accident. One member of the team, Guy Knickerbocker, found when attaching the electrodes to the dog. With the pressure of the electrodes on the chest, there's a blip in, in the blood pressure. So, uh, he told me about this, and I said that was very interesting. And uh, he continued with some of these studies and found that if he pressed and substituted his hand instead of the, the uh, electrodes and the heart being in this quivering activity, that blood was being circulated, you could go up to 30 minutes and still have a dog which was perfectly normal. Niggerbacher, Cowenhoven, and Jude began experimenting on the best method to maintain artificial circulation. 
Cowan Hovind and his team emphasized chest compression, safer in Elam, mouth to mouth. The two techniques came together, and at a conference in Ocean City, Maryland in 1961, cardiopulmonary resuscitation, CPR, was born. These training efforts were aided by the creation of a lifelike training mannequin. In Norway, at an anesthesia meeting, Dr. Lind was turned on by our data and approached his friend, Dahlmaker, Mr. Asmund Lerdahl. Osmond Lerdahl, a Norwegian doll maker, knew personally about resuscitation. Years before, he had found his two-year-old son, Tor, floating face down in the fjord in front of their summer house. Luckily, Tor was revived. Dr. Lin asked Lerdahl to design a realistic doll that could be used for practicing life-saving methods. Two months later, Lerdahl showed up in Baltimore, and shortly after he returned home, there was a prototype. He found his model in a death mask of a young woman drowned in the river sink. Her face is both beautiful and peaceful. He called her Risafiani. So, it's a privilege to be back in Baltimore for more collaboration. As this uh, video clip showed, our family company started 70 years ago making toys. First, life-looking life uh, uh, toy dolls. And then, with the discoveries in Baltimore, there was a more meaningful mission to make a life-size, lifelike doll to spread these new uh, life-saving techniques to millions and millions of people. And after 50 years now, an estimated 400 million people have been trained an estimated two-thirds of those on Rissasian mannequins from Norway, and two million lives is the estimate of the number of saved. Most of these patients have been saved from sudden cardiac arrest in developed countries. Today we make uh, mannequins of uh, different uh, types uh, to train lay rescuers, such as this uh, low-cost uh, inflatable mini Anne using the same face mask as the original uh, Princess from 1960. We are making uh, therapeutic and training equipment for uh, EMS personnel and first responders of all categories. We are making sophisticated uh, uh, simulators for hospital workers. And patient simulation has really become the major growth engine of our commercial company, Ladal Medical, today. Actually, here you see the pioneers, you see to uh, the left, <coughs> Dr. James Jude, and then Dr. Guy Nickebocker, at the opening of the simulation center at Johns Hopkins in 2008, together with the director of that center, uh, Dr. Elizabeth Hunt. We have, and I'm very pleased to say, an excellent collaboration with uh, Johns Hopkins uh, even before coming to what I'm going to present today, we have in the audience uh, Dr. Pam Jeffrey, who is the uh, Associate Dean of the School of Nursing uh, here in um, Baltimore. And um, she has uh, been instrumental in introducing uh, patient safety training or um, simulation training in the National League of Nursing. We are also the proud uh, sponsor of an annual memorial lecture uh, for Dr. Deborah Hunt, who was uh, uh, the uh, leader of the Maryland School of, of Nursing. Today, uh, Lerdal is uh, uh, based in Stavanger. Our headquarters are encircled uh, in the lower right. We have um, three different entities, Lerdal Medical, which is um, a commercial company with 1,400 employees with uh, R&D in Norway, USA, Denmark, and China. Production in three countries, including in China. And we have our own sales companies in 24 countries. The Ladal Foundation has been established with uh, help of earnings from the company. Today has a capital of in excess of $70 million. It has supported over the last 30 years, uh, largely with smaller grants, uh, over 2,000 research projects. 
But it has taken a stand now, and uh, it has earmarked uh, 10 million US dollars in support for MDD4 and 5 uh, projects over the next three years. Furthermore, we have established uh, uh, quite recently a LADA Global Health, where I'm now spending 90% of my own time. It's a not-for-profit uh, company focused fully on MDD 4 and 5 uh, projects. So we have three independent entities, and at times uh, uh, I need to balance my various hats. But although they are independent companies, they indeed share the mission of helping save lives. And I think it's more relevant to talk about synergy of interest than of conflict of interest. Which factors decide uh, chances of survival? This is the outcome from one of the um, Utstein uh, expert meetings uh, to try to uh, set directions for future research. And it postulates that the chances of survival may be expressed as a, f uh, as a multiple of three factors, the medical science, multiplied by the educational efficiency, multiplied by the local implementation. And uh, there is reason to believe that the relatively weaker part, uh, factors are the latter two. As it was expressed in uh, a keynote uh, at an NIH implementation research conference that I attended, 95% plus of medical research are breakthrough oriented so little is follow-through oriented. And that, I think, is an important uh, thought for uh, what we're coming to next. The day of birth. <clears throat> if we look at which lives can be, uh, can be impacted, which lives can we help save with CPR? Well, the obvious one that everybody would be thinking of in the States would be pre-hospital cardiac arrest. Worldwide, there may be in the region of one million patients dying from sudden cardiac arrest every year. If we look at who they are, 80% of them are in developed countries. This is a lifestyle disease. The average patient is 68 years of age. Two of three would be men. But if we look at the other perspective, the day of birth, only birth asphyxia, that is a non-breeding baby, would claim close to 900,000 lives per year. And in addition, about 30% of the 3.5 million classified stillborn are actually having a heart activity during delivery. And they should more appropriately be classified as asphyxia. And now look at the color we have now hardly a visible yellow part accounting for 1%. This is 99%, as the students told, a, a problem of the developing countries. Furthermore, we have coming down to slightly less than 400,000 maternal deaths in excess of 1,000 per day. And as the MDD4 goal was established, it was generally agreed that 75% of those could be prevented. So these are the numbers. But if we look at the life-saving potential, let's have a closer look at the three of them. There is a survival of certain cardiac arrest patients in this country around 7%. If we think of this formula of survival, one should think that was fairly equally distributed, or 7% here and 7% there. Well, actually, there is a tenfold difference among EMS systems in the United States in survival for pre-hospital cardiac arrest. They have the same medical science, they have the same teaching material, but there is a vast difference in implementation. If we could bring the average up to, or, or the lowest quartile up to the highest quartile, it would take a lot of efforts in implementation, sorry, uh, but it is estimated that that could uh, result in 10% more patients saved. That is 100,000 additional patients. We're talking about 68-year-old patient. Let's say we give him 10 more year or her. So we are saving 1 million 
life years per year by this effort. If we could use the same resources uh, for the other two categories, there is the belief that 50% of the birth asphyxia patient could be saved. These are not 68 years, they are zero years. They have a life expectancy of 50, and we're talking about 50 million life years. And the similar um, exercise now for maternal death would give us 7 million life years. So we see that if we could really apply our knowledge to the day of birth, and we're talking about securing oxygen to the brain in the critical minutes, where there is very few uh, healthcare workers that are skilled, if they are present at all. So therefore, what is needed is a integrated effort at saving lives at birth, and that has led to two new programs, one called Helping uh, Babies Breed, dealing with uh, neonatally and the MDD-4, and the other one helping mothers uh, survive or deliver, and focusing initially now with JAPAIGU on uh, postpartum hemorrhage. Millennium Development Goal number four and five, they share the same challenge, uh, to have somebody there at all who can uh, take care of the unexpected emergency. So this shouldn't be two different, uh, two different projects, one owned by the pediatricians and one by the obstetricians. The challenge is to have somebody there and to be able to handle the patient, whether the patient is the mother or uh, the infant. So, 90% of all babies, be it in the States or in Sub-Sahara Africa, they spontaneously start to cry, and then when they cry, they breed. So, this is... Uh, the normal situation, and uh, the Helping Babies Breed is based on an action plan which is highly visual, uh, icon-like. There isn't a lot of text or no unnecessary text there because we need to teach also illiterate uh, healthcare providers, community health workers. And it postulates that you follow the uh, traffic light uh, uh, colors, and for 90% it's a matter of keeping them in the green zone and giving them routine care. For 10%, they need help. They are born in the yellow sector, and that yellow sector, the light will change. It will change within 60 seconds. Within the golden minute, it may change to red, it may change to green. And this course is about helping them change to green. So we want to change in this way, and we want this traffic light to change to green. This is a simulation-based course, and in addition to simulation of techniques, we also try to, to make uh, the course takers appreciate sense of urgency, which isn't very well developed in Africa, so what we're doing is to start the first uh, practical exercise is to count down 60 seconds and everybody is asked to keep their breath for 60 seconds. So, sorry. So if you now try to hold your breath, We will not have time for this, so I will fast forward, but I can tell you that if I ask you to raise your hand, about 5 to 10 percent of you would be able to hold your breath for 60 seconds. And you're sitting relaxed. This baby may have gone through a quite traumatic, strenuous uh, birthing period the last hour. And this exercise is to help people imagine what is the situation of that baby? Why is this urgent? Why do we need to help that baby start breathing? Okay? So the course uh, takes the um, students through scenario-based teaching. Here we see uh, uh, 
simulation or training in hand washing, uh, in uh, uh, keeping the airways clear, in ventilating for the baby. It's using highly visual, simple teaching material that facilitates a cascade dissemination model. Uh, we at Laudan have had the uh, privilege of being the educational designers for all of this material. And let's see what, uh, how this is coming across and uh, what is the opinion. It was recently uh, uh, exposed to training of uh, 150 master trainers from 26 different African countries in Addis Abeba. It's, it's very hands-on, it's very, very practical. You know, the, 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 the simulators, you know, feel very, very real. You know, when you are ventilating, I have a background in obstetrics and gynecology, you know, so I've delivered quite a few babies myself, you know, and I know the problems we usually have, you know, with training midwives, training community health workers on the job with live babies, you know, but these simulators are absolutely, absolutely brilliant. They make the whole, you know, simulation exercises feels very real, you know, as if you are doing the real thing. I said we are making uh, simulators that Ten thousands of dollars. Here is the uh, simulator that you just saw. It's a uh, water-filled two kilo baby. And there are three things you need to learn in this course and react to. Is the baby crying? Is the baby breathing? And the instructor has two bulbs. And when I squeeze this bulb, uh, you can actually see the, the chest rise. When I squeeze the other bulb, you can feel the umbilical pulse. This is a 50 US dollar mannequin. And there are currently in excess of 12,000 of them in use in developing countries. It's very important that these models are highly affordable to allow maximum practice. Not only to allow in-pair training, because they're used to uh, lecturing, but this course is to train in pairs of two, but also to allow workplace refresher training. As this is spreading from the uh, institution where you have midwives and nurses that may perhaps deliver several hundred babies, they will have sufficient practice opportunity to refresh what they learned in the course. But the problem is that 75% of uh, the deliveries take place out in the country. In some countries like Ethiopia, 90% take place in the home. And the only way to reach them, or a large proportion of these mothers, is through community health workers. They may have additional tasks, so they don't have the number of deliveries to allow them practice. Therefore, these uh, Simulators should not go back to the cupboard of the instructors. They should be placed in the labor wards in the, uh, in the most basic uh, health institutions so that they are available for regular refresher training at least once uh, a month. Very important uh, since most of the challenges in delivering such a program relate to uh, uh, implementation is then this Global Development Alliance, which has been formed with these partners, uh, where we're the uh, proud uh, partner with uh, USAID, National Institute of Child Health Development, Save the Children, and the American Academy of Pediatrics to help roll out this course and support national strong rollout plans based on strong local ownership. That is absolutely essential. And uh, at this stage, uh, the Helping Babies Breed program is uh, rolling out in about 30 uh, countries. There was a first outcome presentation at the Pediatric Academic Societies meeting in Denver uh, last Tuesday. And that showed that after 7,000 post-intervention, post-training, uh, deliveries in Tanzania, there was a 50% reduction in birth asphyxia. This is really remarkable results, 
And if they're holding up, this course can be one of the main contributors to many more countries reaching development goal number four of reducing uh, infant and child under five uh, births by two-thirds by 2015. Furthermore, we are privileged to uh, be recognized uh, in this uh, uh, new uh, uh, Saving Children at Birth initiative. And uh, let's listen to what... Another breakthrough could dramatically reduce birth asphyxia, problems with breathing that account for more than a quarter of the newborns who die at uh, birth. Resuscitating a newborn can be a very delicate procedure requiring significant training. So USAID and the National Institutes of Health partnered with uh, Lairdal Medical to design and deliver a cheap resuscitation device that can be used with minimal training to help a newborn take her first breaths. This resuscitation device and the cell phone vouchers are the kind of simple, low-cost solutions that can become ubiquitous and make childbirth so much healthier. We want to generate dozens of these out-of-the-box ideas. Let me give you a couple of um, examples of simple innovations. For suction, um, in this Helping Babies Breed course, uh, what is typically used is a bulb suction like this. These are single patient use items made for developed countries. But they can't afford to discard them after use, so they keep using them. But they are impossible to clean. You can't get inside them and you can't see whether they're clean. And they're made of rubber, so they don't withstand boiling. Therefore, we came up with this alternative, which is which is a penguin. It's of silicone. The head can be taken off, it can be flushed, it can be boiled. You put the head together again, and you can see through it because it's translucent or transparent that it has been cleaned. So it's ready for use again. It can be used hundreds and hundreds of times. Similarly, um, the most challenging part of this course is to uh, ventilate with a bag well mask unit. And that is fine for those who have frequent practice. But most of those who we need to train will not have frequent practice. They have a problem with mask seal, with skill retention, and certainly with disassembly and cleaning because there are 12 parts in this device. So, one could approach this differently by looking at two scales. What is the frequency of use? What is the prior level of training? And what is the clinical situation they're going back to? Midwives and nurses, they have high frequency of use. They have high frequency of, or, or a lot of medical training in beforehand. So they need an improved version of the current uh, device. Auxiliary nurse midwives, which dominate uh, deliveries in India, uh, they need a simplified device. And community health workers may need an even simpler device. This approach uh, we think has not been uh, pursued in the past, but may be a better way to roll out uh, this. So let's look at saving lives at birth and come to uh, the mother now, because we are well underway with Japaigo to develop uh, the uh, sister program. Here you have helping babies uh, breathe, and here we have helping mothers survive bleeding after birth. It follows exactly the same uh, ID, the same color coding, the same uh, flip over, and so on, and it will be a very practically oriented course, which we can see a quick demonstration of here with uh, Berhane. She is uh, one of the Japaigo B Monk instructors in uh, Ethiopia, and uh, the uh, midwife to the left is the president of the Eth Ethiopian Midwifery Association, and uh, they are wearing here. Mama Natalie, which is our new birthing simulator giving birth to the baby you just saw. So rather than having a 
fasting model over on the table, here we have communication training, which is extremely important to get the right attitude, to show the dignity, to motivate these pregnant women to come to institutions to deliver. She is delivering it now with her hands. This uh, mannequin is available at $150. It contains, amongst others, a blood tank of one and a half liters. And after that, the baby is now delivered. The cord is clamped. Um, we have a controlled removal of the placenta. If the placenta is complete, uh, we may have no problems. But at this stage, the uh, uh, instructor who acted the uh, delivering mother could then initiate a postpartum hemorrhage. And she can then also depending on the right uh, administration of mesoprostol or oxytocin and the right uterus massage, she can have the uterus contract and, uh, and, and the bleeding stop. It's a highly realistic uh, training setup. It's actually designed by a um, designer from Guatemala uh, who was working uh, for um, the um, development manager of Lada Global Health, uh, Toing Gawik, who is in the audience. And um, uh, this is a write-up in uh, one of the major Guatemala papers, and you see how uh, uh, simple uh, construction this is. We had the midwife's day on May 5, and uh, these are two pictures from Baltimore. These are two pictures from uh, Stavanger, our home uh, city. In both uh, places, uh, we took part in uh, uh, midwifery walks, and uh, uh, they were given uh, birth by Mama Natalie in both these uh, parades. And uh, we introduced also then a new uh, buy one, gift one program. This program, product, uh, which we believe will also have a major uh, potential in developed countries, for every time somebody buys this in a developed countries, another model will go to a pool that Japaiga will be invited to uh, have the control over, where programs in developing countries can apply for free models uh, to uh, embark on their uh, postpartum hemorrhage training. Um, this new company we set up has um, some uh, um, objectives for 2015. We hope to be a significant contributor in alliance with others in achieving MDD 4 and 5. We hope to help train an addition of one million birth attendants in both of these programs. We hope to launch 10 to 15 truly innovative, disruptive innovations and to help save an addition of 250,000 new lives per year. That is uh, by far the most important uh, goal financially. We hope, because these products are going to be extraordinarily affordable, we hope to reach $10 million, which in case would be less than 2% of what Ladal Medical is having of revenue. We hope to break even in year five, and we hope to get there with a sunk cost of no more than 20 million US dollars. But we're willing to invest that to get to break even and to achieve 2% of uh, the revenue of the other company. If we do so, we think we can achieve perhaps two thirds of the total mission of these two companies because they both have the mission of helping save lives. So let's now finally then look at the alliance. What is this about? What is innovation? It's a term that is very, very often used, is in fact used in the logo of both uh, CIBID and Japaigo. So what is it? Well, innovation is not what innovators do. Innovation is what the customers adopt, to quote Michael's Rage. This is pretty consistent with uh, what we saw Joseph uh, read out earlier today, part of the CIBIT mission statement. Our key measure of success is the positive impact 
of our students and our innovations on the quality and accessibility of healthcare. We need to go all the way. We need to implement these innovations. Then they are true innovations. We also heard about uh, the typical term from bench to bedside, or as Harshad and others are talking more and more about, from bedside to bench to bedside. But in the developing countries, that is not straightforward. There are many, many barriers to get there. More barriers than we have here in the States. And if you put them in a traditional linear innovation process and sort of group them where they typically end up, it is quite thought-provoking that most of these barriers relate to implementation. So we have seen some tremendous technological, conceptual innovations presented by the students. Is there any way, anything we can do together to help get these uh, developments out so that they do impact healthcare? If we look at the three parties' um, relative areas of expertise, relative again to the traditional model, this is arguable, but Japaigo has a very strong knowledge about, about needs assessment and is very active in implementation with uh, programs going in more than 50 countries. CIBID makes some wonderful concept developments and iterative prototypes, but so far are not that involved in industrialization and in implementation, certainly with exceptions for what we see of uh, these business uh, or startup companies, but that is even more of a challenge as you go to the developing countries. And Lerdal, well, we would hope to have a part in most of these, um, most of these legs of the uh, innovation process, but have to admit that our expertise probably is first and, for, first and foremost in this context in efficiency of manufacturing and in the business model and in implementation and distribution. So you see that we have pretty complementary strength if we could work together. We should integrate these strengths uh, that we again see just put in, or the relative strengths are now put in three uh, bubbles. So if we could bring them together, we can really help bring about integrated innovation. A more uh, uh, familiar, perhaps, and modern way of depicting this would be stressing the importance of iterative prototypes. That's clearly very, very uh, important um, for driving innovations. But these circles of testing and refining and, and, uh, and then testing again, that happens to all of these links. And if we bring together our talents and uh, over time we can have a continuous improvement uh, as illustrated by this adapted uh, model of deming the quality cycle, testing, refining, and finally, in the implementation link, scaling up. So our commitment to what we're launching today, announcing for the very first time, is may, rumors may have reached some of you, but uh, this is a soft launch, uh, is to... Uh, enter into an alliance with CIBID and uh, Japaigo. We are proud to do so, and we are committing to funding the Global Health Clinical Field Immersion Experience every year through 2015 for the new group of students, and to fund two uh, selected concept developments in that year, as well as to establish three LADA Global Health Fellowships to take selected products to successful, successful launch in year two. These are the financial commitments. I think more important is our commitment to, as an added value partner, 
join innovation projects with particular focus on industrialization and distribution. So to try to sum it all up, modern life-saving techniques developed at Johns Hopkins 50 years ago have already saved millions of lives. By far the greatest opportunity is going forward relates to saving lives at birth in developing countries. And our new alliance, we can make a real difference and enable us together to save many more lives together. Thank you very much. Good morning, everyone, or good afternoon. Um, first tour, as always, very inspirational. Um, for those of you that don't me, I'm, the, I'm Leslie Mancuso, the president and CEO of Chapaigo. Uh, I think you've heard the need. I think you've heard today one woman every minute dies due to pregnancy-related causes. I think you've heard about the plight of newborns and children relating to that. Without question, all of that should be compelling forces for this alliance to come together. This alliance is a breakthrough in that this alliance will look at taking that research, taking that science and evidence, and translate it into practice. This alliance will allow us to look at that need and shorten that time between the need and disseminating the ideas and the technologies and the services out into the developing countries where it needs to go. Chapaigo has a platform in more than 50 countries, but obviously our concern is having the brilliance of CBID, the brilliance of Lairdal, and our team coming together to look at those practical solutions that must take effect for us to change the lives of women and their families. Without question, at the same time all this is going on, Chapaigo will be working with WHO, governments around the world, the Ministry of Health, and all critical stakeholders in this so that we can create this world acceptance and belief in the standards and practices of these new discoveries. I think you can tell that we are all amazed with the brilliance of Tor Lairdal, uh, his company, and certainly he himself. He is a visionary, as you could tell. He is extremely brilliant, but most importantly, he is one of the most dedicated and committed individuals you could meet. He, had, he stood before you talking about the ideas and the ways to take these ideas forward. Yusuf, and TOR, we believe, make this critical component of an alliance together that will truly save our mothers, our newborns, and our families in, throughout the world. Let me just say that Chapaigo is thrilled. We spent Two years ago, we started the relationship with Yusuf and his team at CBID. I must tell you that we are looking forward to strengthening this relationship. And in fact, Chapaigo is now going to support two additional fellows um, from the School for Global Health over the next number of years. So we are really, really thrilled to be part of this. And again, I thank our alliance and our team. There is an incredible amount of respect. But most importantly, as you could hear Tor speak, we're all about saving lives. This is the core of this alliance. This is why we stand here before you. Thank you. Thank you very much, Leslie, um, and thank you, Tor. We're also, um, on behalf of all of CIBIT, uh, we're very proud and honored to be joining this alliance with you. This relationship between Japaigo and CIBIT started years ago with uh, Dr. Acharya and Dr. Uh, Sangvi working together on the proteinuria pen and other projects, and it emerged from uh, the undergraduate program as well. We've had some early successes that really proved that working together we can solve critical problems. The missing piece has been the, the presence of a, of a company that really knows how to deliver low-cost innovation worldwide. And we're very honored to have this partnership launched today. Thank you very much.
So thank you all very much. Next on the agenda, I would like to invite our very own clinical director, Dr. Jay Khanna, who will say a few words of special thanks to probably the most critical component of the CIVIT program, and that is the interaction between our students and clinicians. Thank you very much. Jay Khanna. I just uh, wanted to prepare some remarks to thank all the clinicians that help uh, with the CBID program. And as I went through all of uh, the points I was thinking about, I ended up coming up with more points as to how the clinicians could th thank CBID for allowing us to uh, work with you. Uh, but uh, I got introduced to the School of Engineering, Biomedical Engineering, and CBID uh, about uh, in 2005 by actually Aditya Polsani, who invited me to come work with the students on a uh, spine project in engineering before I think CBID was uh, started. And since then, I've had the opportunity to work with maybe seven to 10 different teams on different projects, and I've been lucky enough to be pulled into the CBID family as uh, the liaison between the School of Engineering and the School of Medicine. Uh, we've, I initially thought I'd make a slide of every clinician that's helped with us and give you a brief uh, snapshot of what they do and uh, how they contributed to the program and the various awards their teams have won. And I thought it'd be maybe 10 or 15 clinicians, but as we started putting the list together uh, last week, we realized this may be uh, 50 to 70 clinicians. Uh, so um, I don't think we'd have that much time. But I do want to thank all the clinicians that are here today and the uh, various clinicians that have helped with the projects <clears throat> over the last three years or so with CBID and over the last uh, 10 or 15 years uh, with the School of uh, Engineering with Dr. Allen's uh, undergraduate program. The uh, level of uh, engagement of the clinicians is huge. Uh, as uh, Dr. Acharya mentioned earlier, uh, the students rotate with the clinicians during the summer in the master's program. Uh, they come to the OR with us, they uh, watch and see patients uh, with us in the office, they iterate with us on prototypes, and the collaboration is really, uh, really amazing. And uh, I think the students learn quite a bit from us on the clinical side, but uh, the clinicians also uh, learn a tremendous amount about the innovation process, about entrepreneurship, about the regulatory process. And uh, the message we try to send to the clinicians is that if you want to learn more about that process, this is the way to do it at Hopkins. Uh, where you can learn about that process, see if you're really interested, and then also have a chance to contribute uh, back to the university with our three core missions of research, uh, teach teaching, and uh, patient care. So uh, thank you uh, to CBID for inviting me to help uh, with the program and giving me the opportunity to pass the message along to the other clinicians. And thanks to the clinicians for uh, feeding back into the system and helping our, uh, helping our students. Uh, a couple announcements. Uh, we are going to have lunch now on the... Uh, Second floor uh, from 12:15 uh, till 1:45. The students are going to be up there with plenty of poster presentations and the students that you met earlier today. So if you want to ask them any uh, questions or fund their ventures, they'll be more than happy to speak with you. Uh, and at 1:45, we have the award ceremony, which will be uh, led by Dr. McVeigh, the uh, chairman of the School of uh, Biomedical Engineering. Any other announcements uh, we need to make? Great. Thank you very much. <clears throat>